So hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're watching this. Um, so today we're going to be talking about some of the real prime principles and fundamentals of Ayurveda. So at this stage in your Ayurvedic program, we've done your intake and now we're going to go over some of these fundamentals in order for you to understand the treatment plan that we're gonna talk about together at our next session. And so just follow along with this video. You're also going to receive this document and you'll be able to reference the document aside from the video. And any questions you have about this, go ahead and save those and then bring them to our second appointment when we talk about your treatment plan together. Okay. So I'm going to share, maybe, there, <laughs> okay. All righty, so we have our background on Ayurveda. So we're gonna talk about a little bit of the history. There's much, much more to Ayurveda than these little snippets, but we're just gonna, we're just gonna dip our toe in. So Ayurveda, which literally means the knowledge and wisdom of life, can also be translated as the science of life or the science of um, nature, the laws of nature, is the traditional healing system of India. It was often called the mother of all healing, and it originated in India five to 10,000 years ago, and is the original pioneer for natural medicine and using food as medicine. medicine. It is the oldest system of medicine in the world. So Chinese medicine is based off of the same principles in Ayurvedic medicine. The Ayurveda was established or practiced first and then came along Chinese medicine, then came along um, Egyptian alchemy, which has similar concepts in terms of um, elements. And I like to point out the reason why there's this five to 10,000 years, that's a big gap. Um, most commonly you'll see 5,000 years um, in terms of its age. However, different Ayurvedic scholars like Dr. David Frawley, um, Ayurvedic scholars who are well-versed in understanding the references in ancient Ayurvedic texts are able to pinpoint that the references in these texts are actually um, highlighting that these texts were written up to 10,000 years ago. Um, however, because so much of the history has been damaged over time, so many of the texts have been damaged over time, it's hard to um, hard for everyone to agree on that timeline. So either way, it's very old. Um, and another big point in Ayurvedic medicine, it is a complete system of medicine. It's a complete medical science. However, it differs from the medicine that we know in Western medicine, in many, many ways, but one big way is that Ayurveda is inherently spiritual. So we're looking at the body, the mind, and the spirit. And if there's an imbalance in one of those, it will cause a disturbance in the other ones. Um, one of the, the big uh, points or foundations of Ayurveda is that Ayurveda is a revealed science. So what that means is that the whole system, the whole medical system of Ayurveda was revealed in deep states of meditation to the ancient rishis thousands and thousands of years ago. And so that was revealed in states of meditation and then they went on to make it um, in a tangible form. They created all of the texts. Um, Ayurvedic practitioners are the first surgeons of the world as well. So there are um, parts of Ayurveda where Ayurvedic doctors are also surgeons. 
it's not as commonly practiced anymore. Definitely not in the West. Um, so Ayurveda is considered the healing side of yoga. Likewise, yoga is the spiritual side of Ayurveda, or it emphasizes the spiritual side of Ayurveda. So both Ayurveda and yoga strive to help a person reconnect to their true nature through direct experience. Together, they encompass a complete approach to the well-being of the body, the mind, and the spirit. So to elaborate on this a little bit, Ayurveda is for the health of our body. Yoga is for the health of our mind. And that might seem a little backwards because especially in the West, how we practice yoga is mostly for the body. Um, however, traditionally and technically, if you are not practicing um, the meditative side of yoga, then you're not actually practicing yoga. You're doing more like gymnastics and acrobats which is fine. Those have many benefits, but it's not technically yoga. If you're not um, using all of the different techniques in yoga to further yourself on the path of self-realization, self-development, ultimately enlightenment is one of the goals, um, then then technically you're practicing something different. So yoga is for our mind, Ayurveda is for the body. And so together they emphasize and support each other on that journey. So for example, if you're a very dedicated yoga student, you're, very, you're doing very intense um, advanced yoga, which advanced yoga doesn't look like handstands and doing splits. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about advanced yoga. In a traditional sense, advanced yoga means intense um, rituals of meditation, of cleansing, um, purification practices of the body and the mind. Those practices take a lot of energy um, and if we are not stable in our body, if we are not healthy in our body, if we have aches and pains mm -hmm. or we have indigestion or we have insomnia, um, not to mention various diseases that alter or inhibit our ability to um, persevere on this path of self-realization, then we're going to be we're gonna be struggling quite a bit. And so that's where Ayurveda comes in to say, these are the daily practices, these are the daily rituals and routines and foods. This is the nutrition that aspect that is really important for each person to work with according to their unique needs in order to fully expand and realize their potential on a yogic path. And then vice versa, yoga helps us with the discipline, the self-discipline that is needed to continue with an Ayurvedic lifestyle on a daily basis. Because a lot of the principles in Ayurveda, especially when it comes to food, when it comes to eating, um, they are the opposite of what we've been taught, especially in the West. Um, and so they can be very difficult. And in the beginning, it can be hard to, to understand, it can be hard to implement, but with the practices of yoga, yoga helps create, depending on how you practice, it can help cultivate willpower and discipline um, and clarity, clear perception so that we understand why, why am I doing this Ayurvedic diet? Why am I doing these Ayurvedic rituals and daily routines, um, but also, you know, this, the side effects of doing these things um, or the results of doing these things is you feel better. And so eventually you don't have to use willpower because you feel better. It's like, nope, I, I want to have my Ayurvedic diet. I want to have my meditation practice because it makes my life better. So that is how yoga and Ayurveda are related. They're sister sciences. Understanding and utilizing both of them makes them both that much stronger um, otherwise it's like, uh, it's like having a bike with, 
I just couldn't think of a, an analogy, but it's like ha learning to ride a bike with one training wheel instead of two. There, we'll say that. Okay, um, so Ayurveda views health and disease as the end result of how we interact with our environment. I'll say that again. Ayurveda views health and disease as the end result of how we interact with our environment. Harmonious interactions lead to health, while disharmonious interactions lead to disease. Ayurveda is the science of developing greater harmony with our environment through all of our senses. So Ayurveda is about five sense therapies. So we're doing a therapy through our tastes, through our taste buds, through our food, um, using food as medicine, aromatherapy, sound therapy, color therapy, um, and then therapeutic touch. So this comes in with um, different Ayurvedic body therapies and different body therapies that you can do on your own as well. So how we interact with our environment determines our health. And environment means our day-to-day -day basis. What do we do on a day-to-day -day basis? How are we interacting with the people around us, with technology, since that's such a big part of our lives? Um, how are we interacting with food? How are we interacting with the world? So according to Ayurveda, we create and recreate the state of health each day based upon how we interact with the world in terms of our beliefs, our perceptions, our thoughts and feelings, which then ultimately determine our actions. So actions in harmony with our inner nature create health, those, while those that are disharmonious with our inner nature create disease. So our beliefs and our feelings about ourself and the world, those influence our behaviors, and then our, our patterns, and then ultimately our destiny, because we, we attract based on what we believe and what we think, but also how we're behaving in the world with others, with ourself. If that's disharmonious or if that's not in accordance to our true inner nature then we're going to see some sort of aggravation or disturbance now your inner nature is called your constitution or in sanskrit it's called your prakriti this unique balance of energy was determined at the moment of conception and is with you the rest of your life it determines what is harmony, what is in harmony with your nature and what will cause you to become out of balance, sick and diseased. Knowledge of your constitution is essential to develop optimal health. Your constitution determines how you react to various foods, colors, aromas and general life habits. So, and we'll talk more about Prakriti and Vikriti. Vikriti is our state of imbalance and Everyone has, most people have a vikriti, a current imbalance that they're de dealing with that can be uh, altered and reduced. Your prakriti is something that is inherently balanced and we want to get you back to your prakriti, to your natural state of functioning. So we want to move you away from your vikriti and back to your prakriti. Um, and your property here, so your constitu constitution determines how you react to various foods, colors, aromas, and general life habits. What this is saying is that everybody's different. Everybody's different, and that's beautiful. And we need to highlight that and honor that by choosing specific foods, specific habits. That means Everybody should really have a different type of yoga practice, a different type of meditation, a different type of pranayama, um, different type of exercise routine, different daily habits. Um, and then of course, how all of our, all of our senses 
um, react to different things is going to be different. And so we need to be feeding our senses different things. Ayurveda is the opposite of one size fits all. It's not everybody should eat apples and kale. It doesn't work like that because we all have different types of digestion. We all have different bowel movements. We all react to healthy things differently. And so that needs to be honored. And we need to take in what's most nourishing for us as individuals, not what is generally thought to be healthy because it depends. Ayurveda says that anything can be medicine, then anything can be poison. That depends on the person, how long you're taking it, for what reason, and when it's applied. So I, um, another point that an Ayurvedic diet is different than a yogic diet. Yogic diet, again, because their point is to reach self-realization or enlightenment, their diet is very different. They usually eat very minimally, no meat, um, because, and this is something you'll come to understand down the road, but because they want to create more sattva, more um, of a pure harmonious quality within themselves. And there's, there's a lot of food or some food that has sattvic qualities, but most food has rajasic or very stimulating qualities and some food has tamasic and heavy qualities, which is not helpful on the yogic path. We want to stay very light so that we can access the etheric realm more easy. Um, and so an Ayurvedic diet, our goal is not self-realization. Our goal is health, preventing disease, managing disease. And so meat, for example, may be prescribed for a specific person, specific reason, and a specific amount of time. Um, people often assume that Ayurvedic diet is vegetarian because yogic diets are, but that's not true. Again, anything can be medicine, including meat, if it's for the right reason. Um, however, Ayurveda is largely plant-based. It's mostly plant-based. We, we would only use meat for specific situations. Um, so we will move on to the doshas. So the doshas are our biological energies that make up our constitution which is our property, right? So there are three doshas. The first dosha is vata. Vata is comprised of the air and ether elements. And it primary, the primary function of vata is to govern movement and communication. So this is the movement within our blood, within our neural pathways, um, within our body, the, the ability to move our limbs um, is a function of vata. The movement of bowels, the movement of food throughout our body and distributing, distributing it into the proper channels and then communication, the, our speech. And this is, this is just a, a glimpse. Vata has more, uh, there's more to Vata than just these, but this is like the, the kind of baseline. Pitta is the second dosha. The elements are fire and water. And its primary function is to govern digestion and metabolic transformation. So Pitta is responsible for the breaking down of our food and transforming it into the things that we need in different parts of the body. Um, kapha, primary, or the elements are water and earth and the primary functions are cohesiveness, structure and lubrication. So kapha is responsible for the lubrication in our joints. Um, when we have dry cracking joints, 
kapha, we don't have enough kapha in the joints. And that can be an imbalance, that can be a phase of life. Um, there are ways to support increased lubrication or um, and of cohesiveness in the joints. Um, Kapha is responsible for the structure of our body, for our tissues, for our fat. So um, our bodies are largely kapha, but that's going to look different depending on how the doshas show up in your body in terms of what your body looks like. So the, how the doshas show up for you literally impacts or determines what your body looks like, what your personality looks like. And we'll, we'll jump into those a little bit in more detail down the road here. Um, so now we're gonna talk about the subtle doshas. So the subtle doshas are the essence of the doshas. So what we just talked about, the subtle doshas are going to relate more to the psychological and the energetic components of each of us. Okay. The so prana, <clears throat> prana is the subtle dosha of vata. It's the master force or a guiding intelligence. And it coordinates the movement of our breath our senses, the mind, our nerve impulses, limbs and organs, the flow of energy through the nadis or our energy channels or meridians is what they're known as in Chinese medicine. Prana expresses itself as enthusiasm, creativity, vitality, and adaptability. A methodical yoga and meditation practice is a method to gather, collect, and harmonize prana. So when when we have balanced prana, we will naturally have enthusiasm for life, creativity, vitality, and adaptability. Um, the doshas, vata, pitta, kapha, we never increase the doshas. We always reduce the doshas. Doshas or dosha means defect. So anytime you notice a dosha, it's usually because they are out of balance. Um, it's not to say that you can't notice their positive attributes, but when you're noticing their positive attributes, you're most likely referring to the subtle dosha. The subtle doshas, we want to be increasing all three of them simultaneously and equally. If we increase one of them more than the other, there will be an imbalance. So we want to increase all three of them. Tejas is a subtle dosha of pitta, and it's the subtle energy of fire. Tejas governs our metabolism, digestion, our determination, and our perception. So tejas is the ability to perceive yourself and your life circumstances with the greatest level of clarity and insight. Tejas allows you to digest food, air, sensory input, emotions, and thought. Tejas builds courage, power of insight, willpower, and right choices. So when we have balanced Tejas, we will have clear perception, we'll have strong discernment, but not, discernment can easily turn into cynicism where we don't trust anything and we question everyone and um, it shifts from just being discerning to doubtful and mistrusting. So that's when Tejas is too high, but when it's balanced, we're not gullible. Um, you know, we have a sharp, quick mind and just clear perception of ourself and of the world around us. We're connected to truth. We're not swayed easily in one direction or another by someone's opinion, by um, you know, what's happening in the world, different events. We are connected to our truth. Ojas is a subtle dosha of kapha, and it's our vital reserve. 
It's the necessary fuel for all mental and physical actions. It provides endurance, stamina, and stability throughout the nervous system. It's necessary for peace, confidence, patience, steadiness, and calm. And it lubricates the myelin sheath, which is a covering around our nerve cells and acts like a conduit on a wire. So ojas is the fuel for our physical and psychological immunity. So someone with a lot of ojas rarely gets sick. Um, they are rarely, um, you know, strongly disturbed by life events to the point of, you know, breakdown or just being very, very upset. And it's not that they have their head in the sand. It's not that they are avoiding reality. It's the opposite. It's that they actually have the strength mentally and physically to face reality, but to do so with, again, clarity, a calmness, a steadiness. Um, and without Ojas, everything else starts to crumble. So as soon as our Ojas starts to become depleted, Tejas will start to waver, prana will start to waver, and we kind of, we start to deflate. We start to lose our, our life essence, actually. Um, without ojas, tejas and prana cannot exist. So ojas is the second piece that we look at in an Ayurvedic treatment program. The first piece that we look at is agni or or our digestive fire and healing our digestion. And then we look at ojas because if ojas is low, it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter what therapy you apply. It doesn't matter what herbs we prescribe. If ojas is low, it won't stick. So we have to do practices and foods that are specific for building ojas. And this largely revolves around um, lifestyle and sleep. And then of course, specific foods and herbs. So those are the subtle doshas. Now the three maha gunas. These are the qualities of our physical world and our psyche. Maha means great. Guna is a quality or attribute. So this, I mentioned this earlier regarding the yogic diet. So we have sattva, rajas, and tamas. Uh, the W, this probably not very relevant, but um, the W in Sanskrit is pretty much pronounced like a V. So it's a sattva. Um, sattva, We'll talk about these in relation to food, but this also relates to our environment. Sattva is light, it's revelation, perception. Um, these two are switched actually. Sattva is the power of wisdom. And there are specific foods, like I was saying earlier, that are specific for cultivating sattva. There are foods that are rajasic. Rajas, rajasic food um, is stimulating. It creates more movement. And rajas is, the, is responsible for the power of action. But if we have too much stimulating, too much rajasic food, and it can just create a lot of movement in the mind and we're not able to rest. It can contribute to racing mind, insomnia, um, too much movement in the gut, burning, inflammation. Um, and then tamasic food, um, delusion, concealment, darkness, um, a form or matter, the power of materialization. So tamas, tamasic food is largely food that has no prana left in it. So there's no life force. It's what we call dead food. It's very old food that's either been frozen for a long time, it's canned, or it's processed heavily in some way, and it's very 
far away from its natural form. It's no longer a whole food. It hasn't been a whole food for a long time. This is what we call tamasic food. And when we eat more tamasic food, it creates more heaviness, darkness, delusion in our psyche and in our body. Um, so those are the three maha gunas. Let's see. Okay. And then we go on to the five elements. Now I need, I apologize, I need to get my computer charger. I don't want it to stop. So we'll come back to this. Okay, we're back. We're gonna go back to our document. Okay, so the elements, so each of the doshas has two elements. And here the elements are further broken down in their relation to the maha gunas. This is all gonna to come together a little bit further down in this document. So earth, the earth element has the maha guna of tamas. And if we think about it, tamas has form, the power of materialization, earth is responsible, for, or the earth element is responsible for substance, and so that they are together makes sense, right? Water element is tamas and sattva. Air is sattva and rajas. Ether is sattva. Fire is rajas and sattva. And so what that means is that when, if we were to go back and look at the doshas, remember kapha is comprised of earth, and water elements. So that also means that if you have a lot of kapha in your constitution, you will naturally have more tamas and some sattva in your constitution. And so what that means further is that tamas is the one, it's the mahaguna as well as earth and water. Those principles are what you have to pay attention to keeping balanced and to keeping, uh, keeping from going too high. So the tendency is gonna be for tamas to get higher, for earth to get higher, for water to get higher, and that's when we start to see the imbalance. Okay, and then the little gunas, so the little gunas, we had the maha gunas, or the great gunas, the big gunas, and the little gunas. This is what I call them. This is what my teacher called them. Um, it's not technically what their name is. It's just maha gunas and gunas, but we call them the little gunas to distinguish. Um, little gunas are the 10 pairs of opposites or the 20 attributes of substances, thoughts, and actions. So the little gunas, this is what we use in Ayurvedic medicine to apply all of our therapeutics and it's how we understand disease. Um, so this is, of course, you know, simplified version, but essentially every disease can be understood according to these pairs of opposites. So we look at, we'll say an inflammatory condition. We'll say, okay, well, we know that this disease can be categorized as a hot and oily and sharp, for example. Those qualities are present. Those qualities are too high. So what we do in Ayurveda, our saying is opposites heal. So the opposite of hot is cold, opposite of oily is dry opposite of sharp is dull. 
So cold, dry, and dull, those are the qualities that are, that are going to balance this inflammatory condition. So then we look at the medicine. What are the qualities of the medicine or the therapy? Is the medicine smooth? Is it rough? Is it subtle? Is it gross? And then we apply whichever one is specific for um, the attributes that are presenting themselves in this person. We're also looking at the person's constitution because if this is also a hot natured person and they're showing an inflammatory condition, then it's a little bit more clear cut in that we're going to apply the opposite. We're going to apply uh, therapies that can be categorized under more cooling. However, if this is someone who naturally has a cold constitution and they're showing an inflammatory condition, then you have to be more careful with the therapies that you apply because you could potentially aggravate their natural constitution while you're treating the inflammatory condition, if you're using herbs or therapies that are cold, too cold in nature. So there's definitely um, a methodical application to all of our therapies, whether it's, um, and therapies include movement, meditation, pranayama, the breathing techniques, um, of course the food, and then obviously Ayurvedic herbs or the pharmacology we're looking at what is the best thing for this person, for the condition, what is the best herb? Because there's many herbs, um, for example, that have similar actions, um, but some of them are gonna be categorized as hot, some of them are gonna be categorized as cold, and those are gonna be better or worse for different people. So when we get sick, for example, we, we run and and go get echinacea or, um, or garlic uh, tablets or something because we know it's like, oh, those are antibacterial. Um, they help the immune system. However, we're not looking at the constitution of the person when we do that. And we don't know that those herbs may potentially aggravate something else while potentially helping the immune system. It could create some other imbalance. So that's why it's very helpful and smart to work with a practitioner when using herbs. So this is our document to kind of collect. This is the part of the document that kind of collects everything into one place. Um, and we're gonna go through each dosha one by one. So we have vata. Remember the subtle dosha is prana. The elements are air and ether. The Mahagunas are Sattva and Rajas. The Gunas are clear, subtle, mobile, light, rough, and cool. So again, opposites heal. So when Vata is high, then we would be applying the opposite qualities of these. Okay. Um, so what does a Vata person look like? How do we identify Vata? So vata in the physical qualities, people with a lot of vata have an ectomorph body type. So this is the person with very small body frame, very small, thin bones. Um, they're generally very short or very tall, but they're very thin. Um, and they have very kind of thin bones. Um, they have thin uh, nails. They tend to have coarse and dry hair. They'll have dry skin. Um, they'll have crooked grayish teeth and they can be either very flexible or very stiff, so one or the other. They're not really in the middle, they're one or the other. Um, and they're kind of indifferent towards food. They eat because they have to, they often forget to eat. Um, food's not a big priority. Um, and then one thing I wanna point out we have all three doshas in us. Everyone has all three. We just have them in different ratios. And so chances are you're going to identify some of each in yourself. Um, 
most people are dual doshic. So they have two doshas that are primary for them. Um, and so unless you're like, you know, 80% vata, you're, you may not present with every single one of these things, right? But a lot of them. Um, when vata is balanced, they are very creative. They're the most creative. They're always coming up with new ideas, um, whether it's for business or projects or for fun. They, they're the imaginative people. Um, out of all the three doshas, they are the most capable when it comes to psychic abilities. Um, and this is because of the air and ether in their constitution, they are more naturally connected to the etheric realm. So they are more connected, more able to um, touch on and open up those channels. They, um, they tend to be very talkative. They're very outgoing. They're social butterflies. They love people. They're very bubbly, charismatic, playful. They think outside of the box. Um, one of their favorite pastimes what might be dancing, some sort of movement. Um, acro yoga, specifically acro yoga because it's off the ground. And so one, one of two big sayings, so opposites heal in Ayurveda and like increases like. So we are attracted to what we already are. So vata, being that they have a lot of air and ether, they are attracted to the things that increase air and ether. Things that increase air and ether have a lot of air and ether in them like acro yoga. Acro yoga, you're off the ground. You're literally disconnected from the earth. So there's no earth element, there's no water element, and you're increasing air and ether when you practice a style of yoga like acro yoga. And that is something that would really appeal to vata types. However, it's not helpful for, for them um, if they're experiencing a vata imbalance. And if they want to keep their vata balance, they would practice more grounding types of yoga. Um, some of the physical symptoms of aggravation for vata, they're going to be the most inclined towards constipation. So that's all the air and ether again. It, they, have, uh, they have a hard time staying hydrated um, and all of the dryness that they're prone to sucks the dryness out of the colon and bowel movements can be a real um, struggle for people with high vata. Uh, low stamina, gas, um, burping, bloating, aching joints, weight loss, lower back pain, dry or rough skin, menstrual cramps, um, intolerance to the cold and having wild muscle spasms and light sleep or insomnia due to being a light sleeper and being easily disturbed. Um, the mental symptoms of aggravation, worry, anxiety, impatience, lack of mental focus, depression, and overactive mind. These are all what Vata is prone to. Um, they can be very scattered. Um, behaviorally, this can show up as insomnia, fatigue, inability to relax, restlessness, low appetite, impulsiveness, disorganized and forgetful, clumsy. Um, we can end up having really poor proprioception. They don't know where they are in space. They don't know where their body is. Um, and they're moving so quickly that they don't have time to react to their environment. Um, and that's where the clumsiness can come in. And they tend to have rambling or repetitive speech patterns. So again, they can end up talking very quickly. They can talk off topic quite a bit, um, a hard time staying focused and they'll repeat themselves. It's like they, they forgot that they just told you that and, and they'll just say it over and over again. So this is Vata.
I'm going to go back up to Pitta. So Pitta body type, mesomorph body type. So this is the medium body frame. They're not very big. They're not very little. They're right in the middle. They naturally have most um, the most muscle development out of all three, whether they work out or not. Um, they may have freckles. They may have red hair. And that red hair, yes, it's coming from the fire element. Um, balding or early grain is really common with people with a lot of pitta. And that is, again, the fire element is so prevalent that it's literally burning the hair off of their head um, or shifting, um, shifting the color of the hair. Um, average height, slightly oily skin, yellowish, medium-sized teeth. Um, and they have the strongest appetite out of all three. They plan their life around food. Um, when they are balanced, they are leaders, they're courageous. They're left-brained, analytical, logical, and strategic. They're the list makers out of all three. They're very adventurous. They can be daring, risk takers, um, and luminous, discerning. Uh, and their favorite pastime is starting a new project. They're very work driven. These, these are either the leaders or the entrepreneurs. Um, they have a hard time not working. Um, they, so starting a new project, strong physical activity or building a fire. So like increases like, um, pitta with people with high pitta can be attracted to fire in one form or another. It's not, it's not an absolute, but there is a, can be a connection there. Um, they like challenging things, things that are hard. So that relates to their physical activity as well. They're the ones that are gonna be doing the power yoga, the ashtanga, um, the, just the, the hard, the hard stuff. Um, when they are uh, out of balance, they're going to be inclined towards skin inflammation or skin disorders. So that's um, acne, rashes, boils, psoriasis, eczema, excessive hunger, thirst, bad breath. This has to do with what they're eating and what they are not digesting. Um, hot flashes, sour body odor, hemorrhoids, heartburn, ulcers, acid reflux, all of the heat conditions, um, IBS, multiple bowel movements a day um, that are burning or very loose, bordering on diarrhea. Um, and their sleep can also tend to be light, but it's mostly because they wake up in the middle of the night thinking about work or thinking about all of their responsibilities, all of the projects that they have to do, all of their obligations. They're just constantly working, even in their sleep. Um, when they're out of balance mentally, they're the ones that are going to show anger, hostility, will be very critical, um, irritable, impatient, um, they can have a deep resentment and intensity about them. Um, and then behaviorally, this can be outbursts of temper, temper tantrums, argumentative. Um, they can be challenging, they challenge authority, be critical of themselves and others. Tyrannical behavior, they can be very controlling and perfectionist. So that's Pitta. Are these sounding familiar yet? And as these become more familiar, you will identify people that you love and know. You'll say, oh, this is this person. And even your animals, you can start that, oh, yeah, this is, my cat is a kapha, my dog's a vata. Like, it's, it's fun to kind of piece it together like this. So now kapha is the endomorph body type. So endomorph, they're the biggest, the sturdiest, 
kind of the strongest of the three. So they have thicker, heavier bones. They're more solidly built. Um, they tend to be stocky. Um, they can still be quite tall um, or short or average, but either way, they're sturdy. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean that they are obese or overweight, but of the three, they are the ones that are inclined to, towards being overweight and obesity if they don't um, balance themselves. Um, they tend to have very thick, voluminous hair. They'll have thick skin and oily skin. They tend to have big white teeth, big eyes, strong males that don't ship, and they'll have a big appetite, but that's largely out of pleasure rather than need. So they can eat a lot, they enjoy eating, but it's, whereas pitta, they have to eat or their stomach will eat itself. Um, kapha is more like they just love food. They, they tend to be um, very sensual and pleasure oriented. And that's where food can come in for them. It's just an enjoyment piece. Um, when they're balanced, they're very generous. They're very sweet and kind people. They provide structure and like to take care of people. And they're generally thought of as big teddy bears. They're very approachable. They're warm, they're welcoming, they're comforting. They make great nurses or caretakers, nannies. Um, um, and then they're also, they can be very good with their hands um, working with the earth. So uh, farmers, gardeners, um, working with wood, woodworkers, um, something to that degree. Um, and within a company, they provide structure. They're the ones that create support and help things get from point A to point B. Uh, Vata people are gonna be the ones that come up with the ideas for the company. Pitta is gonna be the person to lead you, um, lead the group. And Kafa is going to be the one to provide that structure, create the spreadsheets, create a step-by-step -step plan. That's where Kafa comes in. Um, they tend to be very calm and easygoing. They move slowly. They are the least inclined to move. They're usually not very inspired to exercise or, um, or to move at all, but uh when they do they have the most endurance out of all three so in the race vata would start out fast and then they'd get distracted by a squirrel or something shiny and get lost and pitta would start out fast too fast and then they'd burn out and have to spend days recovering um and then kapha would just start out slow and steady just like the tortoise slow and steady, and they would be the one to win. Um, and they're the least likely to have um, side effects from doing a challenging exercise, um, whereas like Pitta is going to be the one to be the most likely to, they want to do the challenging exercise, they, they want to do it, they need to do it, but they can often experience some sort of inflammatory um, result. Whereas Kapha, they can do the challenging thing and they're probably not going to have any side effect. Vata can try the challenging thing, but because they have no earth or no water, they have very little substance to their constitution, they can really throw themselves into a tizzy if they work themselves too hard physically and they can create a lot of issues. So Kafa people least likely to move, but they're really the best at um, more vigorous or endurance type movement. Um, their favorite pastimes, cozy up on the couch with a good movie and a snack, um, working in the garden, getting a massage, again, doing something pleasurable, relaxing, easy, just, enjoying enjoyment. 
Um, the physical symptoms of aggravation, they can be intolerant of the cold and damp. Um, so like the Pacific Northwest, that kind of uh, climate can be very aggravating for them. Um, they tend to get a lot of sinus and chest congestions or infections, lung infections. Um, water retention, bloating, high cholesterol, frequent colds, weight gain, allergies, asthma, phlegm, um, cough, sore throats, cysts, diabetes, excessive sleep. Um, all of those can be things that cough experiences when they're out of balance. And mental symptoms of aggravation, inertia, lethargy, weariness, lack of energy, a stupor, depression, and over-attachment. And then behaviorally, this can end up looking like procrastination, greed, um, their, their generosity flips and turns into greed. They can develop uh, a real stubbornness and they can't let go of things, both um, literally and figuratively. They, um, well, they can't let go of, of items. They like to show hoarders when people can't let go of items in their house when they're just collecting and collecting, they can't let go. That is a cophic imbalance. Um, inability to accept change, oversleeping and drowsiness. So they'll be the ones asleep for you know, 10, 12 hours when they're out of balance. Um, possessiveness, slow movements, resistance to growth and lack of motivation. So those are the doshas, a little bit more in depth. We've kind of drawn it all together. The, the earth elements or the, the elements in general, they're gonna come into play down the line as we look at food more specifically. But for now, this is our breakdown. And then we're gonna talk about um, the cause of disease according to Ayurveda. So this is the last piece of this video. And then we'll have our meeting to talk about how all of this shows up for you and then what the treatment plan looks like for you. So the cause of disease according to Ayurveda, number one is failure of the intellect. Failure of the intellect, what this means is we all have a feeling or a sense of what is right for us. What is the right choice? You're asking yourself, should I eat this? Or should I uh, you know, choose this program to enroll in? Or you know, whatever it is. And we hear the answer or it's something that's just more obvious. Like, should I... Um, should I engage in this potential harmful behavior, whatever it is? And we know the answer. It's like, mm, no. And we do it anyway. <laughs> we all have this. We all have this in varying degrees. So what this is, is that our, our connection to that part of ourselves, it's failing. We're, we have kind of lost for whatever reason. And there are many reasons why we don't listen to that part of ourselves. Um, but there's this failure of the intellect to inspire or motivate us to actually choose the thing that we are hearing we should or should not do. We, and so that ends up leading to the second cause of disease, which is the misuse of the senses. And misusing the senses results in just about, you could categorize many, many diseases as coming from the misuse of the senses. First and foremost, the misuse of our sense of taste. So we abuse food um, knowingly or not. 
Um, whether it's from emotional eating, whether it's from eating disorders, under eating, um, whether it's just from eating too much of the wrong thing for too long without knowing, we just don't have the education. Um, like many generations did not have the education of what eating, you know, potatoes and meat for every meal, what that could potentially what kind of imbalance that could potentially contribute to. Um, it leads us to abuse a variety of our senses, um, including our sense of sight. So again, with technology, how prevalent technology is in our society today, that's what we're using now. It's, it's a privilege and a blessing, but it's also something that's really important to manage for the sake of our health in terms of how much we use it. Um, misusing the senses for a long period of time ends up contributing to biological time. And what this is referring to is the rate at which we live our lives. So the more fast paced, overstimulating and tiresome our lives are, it speeds up biological time and it speeds up the rate at which we can experience disease. So it speeds up their six stages of disease. It can speed up the rate at which we progress through those stages of disease and we actually see the manifestation of disease. And so we'll see very young people um, with you know, full blown stages of disease um, that potentially if we were living differently, interacting with our environment differently, eating differently, behaving differently, thinking differently, all of these things slow down biological time. So essentially when we live a simpler, slower life, we're not overworked, we're not not sleeping, we're not overeating, we're not under eating, um, all of these things contribute to a more balanced life and it slows down the rate at which we may experience an imbalance or a disease. Um, so these are the main causes of disease and these are what we look at of reversing or undoing or preventing from continuing in the way it has, in the way that has gotten us to the point that we're at, that we're experiencing whatever sort of disturbance that we are. We're gonna look at why are we not listening to this voice? What's going on in our life, in our psyche, in our belief system that is telling us to constantly go against the part of us that has our best interests at heart. We look at how we're misusing the senses and how that misuse of the senses is contributing to our life, our life force being sucked up faster, essentially. Okay, so you will have this document the next time we meet. We're going to go over, like I said, your treatment plan together. Um, You'll have this for your records. If you have any questions, write them down and save them for our next appointment. Thank you so much for taking the time to go over this and I will talk to you soon. Goodbye.